Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing a quick video on blood and the cells you can find in blood. So I'm going to be going through red blood cells, platelets, and a couple different white blood cell types. Please excuse the spelling mistakes on my slides. Uh, I wrote these really quickly and this program does not have spell check. So if you find any hilarious spelling mistakes, I hope I can clarify them for you as I talk over the slides. Next, so let's start off with what is blood. Blood is made up of two main components. It's 45% plasma and 55% cells. So of these 55%, the major component is red blood cells with one, around 1% 1 of the 55% being white blood cells and platelets. So I'm gonna start off uh, this blood presentation by talking about two different formed elements you can find in blood. Now what is a formed element? It, formed elements are not cells, so they are classified as something separate because they don't have nuclei. These two formed elements are erythrocytes, or red blood cells, and platelets, or thrombocytes. Both of them do not have nuclei and are classified under the heading of formed elements. Erythrocytes are developed from proerythroblasts, which then become reticulocytes. Uh, so a reticulocyte is an immature red blood cell, which will eventually eject its nucleus and become a mature red blood cell known as an erythrocyte. Uh, a couple of important things to remember about erythrocytes is that they're 7.8 nanometers long, or their diameter is 7.8 nanometers, and they're 0.8 nanometers thick. They also have a lifespan of around 120 days, so around three months. Erythrocytes have a classic donut shape, which you'll see down here in this histology slide, with a, clear, with a clearer center, not entirely clear because there's still cell there, but they have a biconcave disc sort of shape, not entirely a donut, so there's no hole. But you'll see that the centers here are more lightly stained than the outer regions. So biconcave disc, which is maintained by three different structural proteins, band 3, 4, spectin, spectrin, and enchirin. Uh, also on this histological slide, you guys will see these darker stained little blots. These are actually platelets. Platelets have a couple of important features. They are also not cells. They're merely cell fragments. They are cell fragments that come from larger cells called megakaryocytes, which send off little um, extensions of themselves into the plasma, and then those extensions kind of lev off and create platelets. These platelets are very important for blood clotting fact function, have very important blood clotting functions. Uh, they release von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen, which aid in the blood clotting process. I'll be doing a blood clotting video soon and I'll go into the functions of these two factors in more detail then. The lifespan of a platelet is around 10 days. Here I also have 5 to 9 days, so anywhere from 5 to 10 days I guess would be an acceptable response. So the important part about this lifespan number is that when someone is on an anticoagulant therapy, uh, like warfarin for example, a surgeon will often wait 14 days or two weeks before performing surgery while they are off that medication so that their platelets will have time to, to uh, reform and be able to clot properly. So it's very important to wait the full lifespan of the platelets so that new platelets are produced. Next, we're going to be talking about leukocytes or white blood cells. Now, people often uh, confuse leukocytes with lymphocytes. Uh, a lymphocyte is merely a type of leukocyte, so don't get that confused. Leukocytes is the general category of white blood cell. It includes granulocytes, agranulocytes, a bunch of other different cell types, and lymphocytes are just T, B cells, T and B cells. Okay, so before we go into different kinds of leukocytes, many of you know that white blood cells, they move throughout the plasma and they have to go inside of tissues to uh, have their function carried out. How do they do that? Well, there are a couple different proteins that assist them in doing this. First, we're going to talk about kinins. These are released at the site of inflammation, 
and cause these endothelial cells on the blood vessel walls to express specific proteins. Now what do they express? They express these green little beads, these are called selectins, and they express red, these red triangles which are integrin binding, essentially in proteins that integrin binds to. So selectin and an integrin target. Um, next you'll see this white blood cell over here, or a leukocyte, and it has selectin receptors which it will bind onto this selectin with, and it also has uh, integrins, which are these red cra crab claw looking things. So selectins and integrins on the selectin receptors and integrins on the white blood cell will bind to the endothelium and then it will move through the blood vessels wall to go to the site where it is needed in the tissue. So let's go into more detail about these different kinds of leukocytes. There are five important ones that you need to know, usually. And they are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. And they vary in their frequency in which you can find them in the plasma. So how I remember the order from most frequent to least frequently found is neutrophils like making everything better. So the first letter corresponds to each word in this sentence. Next we're going to be talking about the different types of leukocytes. So there are two type main categories, granulocytes and agranulocytes. The only difference is that, well the main difference is that granulocytes contain specific kinds of granules that differentiate them with the specific functions. All of these leukocytes contain something called a xyrophilic granules, which are nonspecific, and they are found in all white blood cells. So, how do you remember which leukocytes are granulocytes and which are agranulocytes? Granulocytes, you can remember by saying the mnemonic GRANPA-BEN. So, GRAN for granulocytes, and BEN, B-E-N, for basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils. Let's go into these granulocytes in more detail. So, neutrophils. What are their defining characteristics? Well, neutrophils have two to five lobes in their nucleus. Anything greater than five lobes, and this is considered pathogenic, and it's often associated with a folate deficiency, but for the most part, you're going to see two to five lobes in the neutrophil nucleus. Their specific granules are lysosomal enzymes, and their main function is to deal with acute infection. So if you remember that neutrophils are the most common white blood cell, they're going to be there first, and they're going to be the first attackers, which will dump their lysosomal enzymes onto the bacteria or invaders to try to kill it. Uh, an important uh, side note is that band cells are also known as immature neutrophils, and if you ever see a neutrophil with a horseshoe-shaped nucleus, which is not this one right here, but if you ever see a horseshoe-shaped nucleus and someone tells you that that's a neutrophil, just know it's a band cell and it's an immature neutrophil. So on to mature horseshoe-shaped nucleus cells. So these are eosinophils. So an important way to distinguish eosinophils is that they have these very red eosinophilic granules, which you'll see in the nucleus, in, not in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm. And that's how you distinguish them, the very red cytoplasm, which are from the granules. And the nucleus is biconcave. Someone in one of my classes once told me eosinophils are eosinophils, and that's how you remember that they look like earmuffs. Eosinophils contain a couple of very specific components in their granules, which a lot of uh, med schools will ask you to memorize. And here they are for you. So they are major basic protein, eosinophil cationic protein, eosinophil peroxidase, and eosinophil-derived neurotoxin. Uh, and a way to remember this is that basic cats per, unless, sorry I misspelled, you give them neurotoxin. So major basic protein, cats for cationic protein, per for peroxidase, unless you give them neurotoxin, so eosinophil neurotoxin. And if you can just remember a cat with earmuffs, that should help you remember all the details that are important about uh, eosinophils. Next we have basophils, and basophils are inflammatory mediators, so they act very similar 
to what a mast cell would do. They release histamine. They are found during inflammation, during allergies, and they're not very frequently found in the plasma. So if you see elevated basophil count, this person might be exp experiencing a allergic reaction and it's important. That's just an important detail. They're known as basophils because their cytoplasms are very basophilic and their granules are very basophilic. The granules often contain things like, well, they do contain things like histamine, which mediates inflammation. They also release leukotrienes. Important thing to note between basophils and eosinophils is that eosinophils, although they're, they mainly deal with parasites, they also have two important enzymes, which are histaminase and aerosulfatase. Histaminase destroys histamine, and aerosulfatase neutralizes leukotrienes. So eosinophils kind of counteract basophils in their inflammatory function. So eosinophils and basophils slightly counteracting each other in that way. Next, we're going to talk about lymphocytes. So these are the T and B cells. If you look at a histology slide of a lymphocyte, you'll see that the nucleus is mainly most of it, and the cytoplasm is pretty scant. There isn't much cytoplasm in these cells. It's because um, these cells often are producing a lot of exogenous or proteins that they secrete instead of keeping inside of them. So an important thing to know about T and B cells is that T cells will mature in the thymus, and B cells will differentiate into plasma cells, which then re release antibodies. So all of your antibodies, IgG, IgE, and the rest will be secreted by your B cells. And they deal with viral infections, autoimmune disorders, uh, cancer, chronic infections. They'll be found in all those kinds of uh, foreign body reactions. And finally, we have monocytes. Now this is, monocyte is just basically an immature macrophage. They have this kind of horseshoe-shaped nucleus as well and they'll be found floating throughout your plasma until they reach their target tissue site and at that point they will differentiate into a macrophage which just basically does endocytosis or phagocytosis of bacteria eating them up and destroying them. Um, macrophages have different names depending on the kinds of tissues that they're in so in uh, lungs they would be called dust cells in skin they would be called Langerhans cells um, in the brain, they're called um, microglia. So just watch out for that. Those are all actually macrophages, and they all come from monocytes. All right, well, I hope this video helped, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.